is Christ. And all God's people say, Amen. God bless you and thank you. What an incredible gift it is for us to worship together on this day. For us to join with each other and be honest with each other and with God, with ourselves about the, the pain of loss, the difficulty of change, of the challenges we face. And in the midst of all of that, do what we've come together to do, and that is to worship God to remember where our hope comes from and to stake our lives in that ground or build our lives on that foundation. So thanks for being here to encourage one another to faith. Let's continue in prayer. God, we do thank you that we have the privilege of opening up your holy word and praying that your Holy Spirit, that gift you've given to us, would open our brains, our minds, our hearts to hear your word. And that your word would be deeply planted in us and grow to bear good fruit, eternal fruit, through us, God. That we too might pass on to each other and to the generations yet to come the good news of your love that overcomes all things. We pray with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things that's really helpful when we face challenges and we face changes in life is to remember that God sees so much better than we do. That as we say goodbye to somebody or to something, and I mean, let's be honest, life is full of that. You go on from one grade to the next, and you got to say goodbye to what's been, and you go into the next year hopeful, but also a little angry, like, what's going to be for, you know, like, and life's like that. Sometimes in our lives, as we get older, we go through a season where it seems like things are pretty stable, or not much is changing, but just wait. It's going to change again. Challenge is going to come your way. That's just what it is like in this broken world. And loss is a part of it. And as we acknowledge that, we can also, we must acknowledge, that's why we come together, one of the key reasons we come together on Sunday mornings, is to remind each other that in the midst of all those changes, God is here, God is with us, God is our resolute foundation through it all. God sees so much better than we do. And I think about when uh, our family came out here, my wife Donna and I had this clear sense of God's leading to come here to Salem Covenant Church to Minnesota. Maybe some of you remember. I remember. Anyway, I won't go into the long story. Just to tell you the short story, you can ask me some other time. We felt it clearly, even though it was a little surprising to us. We had a really good life ministry. Donna, in particular, she had a good, good working life out there. I knew I was going to a new job out here, but she didn't know that. She couldn't see what was next. All she could know was that she needed to take this step of faith. That was God's call for her, for us, and so she would take it. But she had to leave behind her friends, her family, her church that you know, she knew there, and this work that was really flourishing for her. She had to say goodbye to all that without having many of those things out here or any of those things out here. And when we came out here, she started slowly. She didn't work for the first year or so, and then very slowly started working. She couldn't see that there would be friends right away. God put people in our lives, that there would be a job that could be part-time, that could grow, that over time has become this flourishing work that she does that has enabled her to be able to teach, train other psychotherapists like herself around the world. Like, it's amazing. She couldn't have imagined any of this. But God could see it. All she could do, all we could do, was take our step of faith. 
And that's all we can ever do. Even when we think we know it's around the corner, we don't know. We do not know. We don't see that well. But we trust the God who sees. We trust the God who has the power and the love to see us through whatever is around that corner. Today's gospel lesson, John chapter 11, it's about Lazarus. I love that song that we just sang. It's about Martha and Mary, Lazarus' sisters, who asked for Jesus to come. They sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was ill. And Jesus didn't come right away. He waited until after Lazarus had died. And then he came. And so when Martha sees him, this is a little earlier in the chapter than what we're going to read, she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And as we pick it up, now Martha's gone back and told her sister Mary that Jesus is calling for her. Mary heads out to go meet Jesus, and we'll pick up the story there. It says, when Jesus came, or when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, and she knelt at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the, the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus came greatly disturbed again to the tomb. It was a, a cave with a, a stone lying against it. And Jesus said, take away the stone. <laughs> Martha said to him, Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of those standing here so that they may know that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. <laughs> His, his hands and feet wrapped in bands of cloth and his face covered with a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Isn't that a great story? Isn't that great news? The climax of the story. They've been waiting. They've watched him die and it all comes together at this verse. But it's not the climax of the story. It's actually just a little piece of the much bigger story that the gospel writer is writing here. He started out his story actually <laughs> at creation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And his gospel will end with Jesus risen from the dead. That's the story. Lazarus dying, rising from the dead, that's just, a, that's just a little piece of the story. It's an important piece. Not so much just because Lazarus rose from the dead, which is an amazing thing, but because Lazarus rising from the dead was the, the final nail in the coffin, so to speak, of the religious leaders putting up with Jesus. Because, again, this just happens a little piece in this long chapter, chapter 11. Before that chapter is over, the very next thing that will happen is people start believing in Jesus. And the religious leader said, we got to kill Jesus. Look at all these people that are flocking to him. Pretty soon, the Romans are going to come in and they're going to wipe us all out. This one man has to die for the many. 
And John tells us, the gospel writer tells us, that that's a prophecy. The chief priest, when he says that, doesn't even realize that he's speaking a prophecy that goes beyond, far beyond what he can see again. He can see a little bit of the story. He doesn't see what God's seeing. This man does need to die for the sake of many. Not just for the sake of the nation of Israel. In fact, Israel will get clobbered anyway by the Romans. But the good news of God's love, the story that God is weaving out over the centuries, oh, that's going to happen. <laughs> and this is one piece in that longer, bigger, greater story. God sees so much further, so much better than we do. In the passage right before this, the verses right before we looked at Mary, when Martha came to Jesus and she said those same words, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died, which, of course, is probably true. Jesus said, says to her, well, your brother is going to rise again. And she says, yeah, yeah I, I know. He'll rise again at the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus says to her, huh, I'm the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who believes in me will never, who lives and believes in me, will never die. I'm the resurrection. And then he asked her, do you believe this? And she says, yes, I, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And really, that's the crucial question for Martha, for Mary, and it's the crucial question for us. Do you believe? In the face of death itself, do you believe? Do you believe what we come together Sunday after Sunday to, to celebrate? Do you, really, do you really believe it? Because that's the call. Jesus looks at Martha and said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? But you've got to believe. The gospel writer, chapter 20, he says, I've written all of this so that you may come to believe, continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. That's the bigger story, and that's the question for us. This call for us in the face of every challenge that comes our way, in the face of all the changes that inevitably come to us, in this broken world where things do not go the way we think they should go, will we believe? Will we have unwavering hope in the God who says his love, nothing can separate us from his love? This is the call to us, to have this unwavering hope. And I think about what a crucial word, what a great word from God for us today on All Saints Sunday as we feel the reality of death, of loss. What a great word for us this week as we go to an election that will inevitably bring about a leader that half of our nation thinks is going to lead us over a, a cliff. Will you hope in God anyway? Will you have unwavering hope no matter what happens on Tuesday and Wednesday and forever? That's the call, to have unwavering hope. Do you believe this, Jesus asked Martha, and he asks us that today. And the reality is that based on God's track record through the ages, based on the revelation of God's grace, his mercy, his power, his love in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can have unwavering hope in the face of whatever comes our way. And lots comes our way. That's human life in this world, isn't it? Unwavering hope. There are three things I want to mention that can help us live out this unwavering hope in our lives and honestly in our world. Because if we're not going to live as people of hope, as resurrection people in this world, then who's going to do it? We're called to live as resurrection people, as people of unwavering hope. So it's three things. The, the first one would be that we grieve with tenacious hope. 
Well, they, we just hang on. I, I love the metaphor that uh, Pastor Terry used in her prayer about God having us on a tether, like when the wind and the wave you know, is tossing us around, we hang on to God. And even better than that, God's hanging on to us. We can hang on. Even if it's just that little glimmer of light, we can, we can hang on to that light. The darkness did not overcome it. The darkness does not overcome it. God is with us. We can trust him with unwavering hope, even in the depth of our grief. Even when the world seems out of control, we can hang on with tenacious hope. We can grieve. We can lament. I love the way Mary laments here. Did you notice? She goes to her knees before Jesus, and she kind of complains. <laughs> if you'd been here. Like, that's what lament is. It's like, God, I don't like it. God, I feel this grief. God, I've got these emotions. I'm not sure what to do with them, but I'm looking to you. I'm crying to you. Help me. That we do all of that on our knees because ultimately we've got that tenacious hope. We trust in God. I think about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. It says, we grieve but we do not grieve as people without hope. We've got tenacious hope in the midst of our grief. Second thing would be that we get to pray with confident hope. Uh, this for me is just one that keeps coming to me over and over again. I love the way Jesus prays in this. Did you catch it? He looks upward. He says, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I, I know that you always hear me. We can pray just like that. That when you pray, when I pray, we can say, God, thank you for hearing my prayer. I know that you always hear me. He turns his face toward us like Jesus did to Bartimaeus, that blind beggar in last week's message. Jesus stops. He listens. God stops. He listens to us. As John says in John chapter 5, we know that if God hears our prayers, he's already answered them. Uh, it may not be quite the answer we're looking for because all we can see is this. So we can pray like Jesus does in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, here's what I want based on what I can see, but not my will, but your will be done. You see so much better than I do. So if you want me to go to Minnesota, I'll go. If you want me to move from this house into that residence, this Lord, I can't see how it's going to work out for some in our congregation. It's just so hard, the changes in our lives, the decisions that we have to make. But we can make them. We can pray to God. We can trust God. We can pray with confident hope that God hears our prayers. And so, I mean, even thinking about praying for each other, praying for those people in our congregation, praying for people in our nation, there might be a few that you struggle with. There might be people in your life who you think, I don't know what God could do with this person. They're out to lunch. There might be people that you have a really hard time getting along with or you just so deeply disagree with them that you almost hate them. <sighs> and Jesus says, love one another and love your neighbor and love your enemy and pray for them. And what you can find is that we can pray even with this confident hope for people we don't have a, we thought we didn't have a prayer for. <laughs> but we do have a prayer for them, a confident prayer for that person, for those people. We can pray for them with confident hope and the God who loves each and every person. This person is created in the image of God, beloved by God. Pray for them with confident hope. Third thing, live with obedient hope. And this, I think, often is the hardest one, right? That God calls us not just to have hope, not just to feel hope, but to live based on that hope. I, I love the fact that when I mean, Jesus says, take away the stone, he can see more than she can see. Martha says, no, 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 it's going to be stinky. There's a stench. She's already been dead four days. Like, there's a good reason not to do what Jesus is telling him to do. And Jesus says, if you don't do what I'm telling you to do, you don't get to see the glory of God. Like, it's when you step out in faith that you get to see the glory of God, when God does beyond what we can ask or imagine, what we in our reasonable minds say can happen. Like when you love your enemy, I can't imagine how that could be a good thing, God. God says, if you do it, you're going to see the glory of God. You're going to see me doing something. You can't do it, but you're going to see me doing things. When you love that person, you have a hard time loving. At our staff meeting this past Tuesday, we shared stories with each other 
When's the time in your life when you stepped out in faith because you felt God called you to do it, but you couldn't see how it could work out? It's really hard, but God worked it out. God worked through it for good. And it was wonderful to share these stories, how God has worked in our lives when we've stepped out in faith. That's when we get to see not just what we can do, but what God can do. When we live with obedient faith. So yeah, acknowledge those reasons that come to mind. Well, here's why I can't do what you want me to do, Jesus. And then reel it back. Help me to do what you're calling me to do. Anyway. Because I'm going to live with obedient hope. And then we get to be not only people who experience the glory of God, but we get to be a part of God's glory being revealed to others. When they rolled away that stone, not only did they get to see the glory of God, but the whole world did. This is our call, brothers and sisters. I'm so excited about it. Even though I too, like you, am anxious about lots of things and certainly grieving this morning. That we can live with unwavering hope in the midst of it all. And I invite you, I call you, I urge you to do that and help me do that too. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your love, for your power, for your vision, for what you see that we cannot see. Help us to trust you and step forward with unwavering hope.